Hello and welcome to One on One on Plus TV Africa. I'm Elsie Godwin. On this episode, we're one on one with the creative director and founder of JB Multimedia Studios, founder of VR360 Stories, and a documentary filmmaker who made history at the Venice International Film Festival as the first African to win the Virtual Reality Awards for his VR docu film, Daughters of Chibok, Joel Akachuku Benson. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Okay, so it's easy for anyone to aspire to be you right now, right? Like, but there's a struggle and there's a story behind this success that everyone is seeing now. Mm. From, I, I saw you talking about how the split of your parents affected you and how you were once an Okada rider and now you are <laughs> winning. To be an Okada you are, rider. well, at least you wrote it, right? So, how would you describe your journey so far? Um, I mean, some people will say, inspiring i don't know i've just lived my life one day at a time but with my eyes on the end game mm -hmm. you know so whatever it is that i have to do now to get to the next level i'll do it so if it was you know um going to someone's house to go and help him clean up his house so that he could show me how to edit um if he was chasing up people on the phone so that they could tell me give me some information that i needed to get you know if it was you know, sleeping in church because there was nowhere to else to stay, but I had to, well, lay my head somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, all of those things, I, did, I didn't, I never saw them as, the, as my destination. You know, it's always like, okay, this is just a bus stop. You know, there's somewhere else that we're going to. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah, I just kept my eyes on the end game. Mm -hmm. And uh, even here right now, there's still an end game. So what's this end game right now? I don't know. I guess the end game, because the end game always shifts it keeps you constantly motivated mm. you know so um, the end game is to be better than where I am now right and and that's 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 you're never gonna get there because mm. you'll always strive to be better okay. you know, regardless of whatever you achieve if you win one award for your film I guess you want to win another one right mm -hmm. um, you know if you make one great movie I guess you want to make another one Right, so you don't rest on your oars. You just keep, keep pushing yourself. Stay hungry. Okay, so what was it like when you won that award? How did you feel climbing that podium? <laughs> ah, it was one of those uh, surreal experiences. Because um, I remember that when, when we sent in the film for the festival, I honestly wasn't expecting to hear back from them. But I heard back from them in a very short time. I think it was like maybe two weeks or something like that. And I remember that I, could, I didn't want to open the email. I just kept staying. I was like, ah, what have these guys told me now? So something else said to me, hey, they've rejected you now. That's why it came so fast. Mm. You know, I was like, well, I mean, I'll just open it. So I clicked on it. And then, you know, just, they were just increasing the suspense for me. Then I say, click on the attachment. OK. Like, <laughs> attachment. It's like, I clicked on it and it was a letter. You know, say, oh, congratulations, you know your film has been selected, you know, to play in Venice mm. and also be in competition. And that was like, wow. For us, it was, that in itself was a big deal because it was the first time, you know, that, you know, an African VR film would play in Venice. So we're okay with that. Went to Venice, have fun. It was fantastic. I was even preparing to start coming back to Nigeria. And then, you know, they said to me, oh, no, sorry, you know, we needed to stay around for a couple more days. Mm -hmm. And you know, you'll be picking up an award. And that was, so we knew we were gonna win the award a day before the award ceremony, you know, we were told. But it was, I remember when, when they told me, I was, I was in tears, I was, you know, I didn't expect it. Hmm. Yeah. All right, so documentary is a very interesting art. I mm. don't think we have too many Nigerians that would gladly come out and say, I'm a documentary filmmaker, but that's how you like to describe yourself. Mm. So what drove you to choosing documentary? Well, I mean, I've, I've always been drawn to real stories. Um, I think that we're not telling enough of those, especially in these parts. Um, I'm drawn to real issues, you know, real human beings, real stories, you know. Um, I've always been drawn to, so, I mean, I, 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 I guess that's what drew me, you know. So it's easy for me to see a film and say, okay, yeah, it was, the script was well written and all of that. but. In a documentary, it's, it is what it is, mm -hmm. you know. So if you say someone like Yana in my film that we took from Chibok to New York, mm. 
-hmm. I mean, how do you make that up? How do you script that? You know, and so that for me is so watching that makes me believe that it's possible for anyone. You know, anything is possible just because I know that hers is a real story. And, um, and yeah, real stories have always uh, intrigued and attracted me, like a moth to a flame. Okay, what would you say is the challenge or the challenges of um, documentary filmmakers in Nigeria? Hmm. Well, I mean, documentary filmmaking is not as hip as fictional films. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't get as much support, right? Um, if you walked up to someone now and said, hey, look, I'm making a documentary film about so and so and so, and I need funding, you know, it, it, chances of getting funding will be slim. So I think that the greatest challenge for documentary filmmakers really is funding to pursue this, their personal projects, you know. I don't know yet of any grants for documentary filmmakers. There may be some that exist, but I've not come across any. You know, so I, I think funding is a major challenge. The stories are there, mm. without any doubt. But how do you get to tell the stories if you don't have the funds? So okay. for people like us, you know, we self-fund our projects all the way because we believe in it. So what would you say about commissioned documentary? Do you think it takes away the art of um, the storytelling or the it's... independence, right, of of, of yeah. the storyteller? Mm -hmm. um, well. It depends on what the, what, what, so there are two types of commissioned work. I mean, there's commercial videos that someone says, oh, make me a documentary on my business. Well, I mean, you have to tell their story. But say I wanted to make something on what, I don't know, police brutality, for instance, and I sought funding. I, I don't think the best place for me to go to would be to the Nigerian police force to fund me to make a film on police brutality because it will be tainted. Okay. So I would have to go to an NGO that probably believes in you know hum human rights, equality, and all that kind of stuff. But I also have to set the boundaries from the beginning, mm -hmm. right? That look, I would need my creative independence to tell the story the way I would like to tell it. You know. So um, it, it's it's all about negotiation. You have to learn how to negotiate and navigate those landmines, so mm -hmm. to speak, so that your artistic integrity stays intact. You know, otherwise, you might as well just be making a commercial. Okay, so what do you think every young filmmaker should be concerned about, especially in this digital age and um, things evolving so fast? What should they focus on and be concerned about? Focus on the story and tell it honestly. Tell it from your heart. Okay. That's, that's, that's the most important thing. It doesn't matter what kind of equipment you have, you know, what kind of gear you have. Just focus on the story and tell it honestly. I mean, the film that we made, that won the award, you know, was side by side with studio budget films, right? And, you know, we, who use better equipment, better, you know, I mean, a more robust uh, structure and system supporting them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, we still came out, you know, okay at the end. Mm -hmm. So I would say just follow the story and tell it honestly. That's that, I think, is the most important thing. Every other thing is secondary. Okay, so we'd like to find out how you got into virtual reality. But before that, let's go on a very quick break, and when we come back, we'll carry on this conversation. Welcome back. This is 101 on Plus TV Africa. We still have Joel Benson in here with us. So before we went on that quick break, I told you we wanted to know how you got into virtual reality, because I know you've been a filmmaker for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So how did you get into VR. Into VR, right? Yeah, so um, I'm making this film in Borno State and a friend of mine, Brahma Mohammed, says to me, hey, look, you know, can, can we make something in virtual reality? I'm like, what's that? He said, there's this camera that if you use it and shoot, you know, you now bring people into this place as if they are here. Like, dude, man, this my camera is good enough. Let me just, you know, I didn't take what he was saying very seriously. Mm -hmm. Fast forward a year later, um, uh, a lady who I've done a lot of work for, Damiel Ogumbi calls me up and says, I want to make a 360 video in Kano. And I said, but ma, I don't do 360 videos. What is that? They explained to me. I said, I don't do that, ma. She said, go and figure out how to do it mm. and bring me my results. She's not someone that you can easily say no to. So I started doing my research. Cut a long story short, I had to fly out to go buy the camera and learn how to use it. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time I wore a VR headset was in, in uh, VR school in Chicago. And the moment I wore that headset, 
I remember what that guy told me, what Brahman told me, you know, the year before. It's just this immersive experience that just, and it was just a beautiful experience for me. I was like, wow, wow. So bought the equipment, did the training, came back to Nigeria, and that was it. My first project was uh, in Bakasi, mm -hmm. which was my first VR film, which is, I mean, arguably the first VR film out of Nigeria, really, mm -hmm. you know. And from then on, it's just been, you know, no looking back. Okay, so from what you said, that you had to invest in yourself oh, yes. to be able to make this happen. Yes. Can, how much would you say, roughly speaking, that you invested? In the to, beginning? Yes. It cost me about 5M. About 5 million. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, virtual reality is like the new call. Everybody wants to move with the trend and know what is going on. But mm -hmm. this trend seems to be the one that is far-fetched, especially when you don't have the fonts. So for a regular person who is picking interest mm -hmm. in VR, where can they start from? Hmm. Well, I mean, there are cheaper cameras mm -hmm. that you can start with. Uh, Google is your best friend when it comes to training. Okay. Go online and, and read up some stuff. Mm -hmm. So personally, if I can afford to go to a physical school, mm -hmm. I don't like to do stuff online. Okay. I'd rather go to the school, pay the money, and learn it so I can ask all the questions, no matter how silly they are, mm -hmm. right? Um, but yeah, you can start online. You can read up on it online. You can buy a cheap camera. There are cameras are like $500, $600 that you can start with and just get your teeth into the game. And, and build from there. Remember what I said in the beginning? It's really, at the heart of it, it's really about the story. If you make a great story, right, that, mm -hmm. that wins an award or gets you recognized, then people will come and meet you and say, hey, man, look, we want to make another film. Can you do it for us? Or people will say, well, we'd like to invest in you, that kind of stuff. I mean, I'm hearing all of that now. Okay. You know, um, that, that's, that's, that would be my, my, my 10 cents worth. Okay, so why did you choose to tell the story of the daughter of Chibok using this medium? Well, Chibok is a place, or the Chibok story is a story I've always been curious about. Um, when the story broke in 2014, you need to remember that there were so many versions of that story. The government was saying one thing, international press was saying one thing, local press was saying another thing. So we didn't quite know, even till now, there's still some shroud of mystery around what really happened to these girls. Mm -hmm. How did 276 girls just get picked up in the middle of the night in a community? And, you know, so I made up my mind that I would go to Chibok. Anytime I have the opportunity, I would like to go and find out for myself. So I was making another film that in the Northeast, you know, that took me around like six states, and we passed through Chibok. And when, you know, we stopped for a day or two, which now extended into a week because I got very interested in what I was doing, met the people, met the women, met some of the girls, and then it was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to stay here mm -hmm. for a few more days and, and see what I can make of this story. That was it. It started as curiosity. Okay. Yeah. And why did you think the VR medium was the best way to tell the story? Have you been to Chibok? I haven't. Do you know anyone else who's been to Chibok, apart from me? <laughs> no, I don't. Great. So VR takes you to Chibok. That was the singular reason why. I could have done a regular documentary, which is what I was doing when I was there, mm -hmm. you know. But I felt that because it's such a far away place and a lot of people haven't been there, but they've heard about it, I felt that with virtual reality, I could take them there and show them what I saw, sort of like relieve the experiences that I had there. Mm. And I don't think we've been far off the mark on that. Okay, so what were your feelings and emotions while we are conversing with the people of Chibok, especially the, the, the lady descent of the character? The women, yeah. Yeah, what, what, what did you pick out of that? Well, I mean, the, 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 obviously the, the, the biggest emotion that you would sense there, or the strongest emotion that you would sense there is, is grief, right? They are mourning, they are still in waiting and they are crying and waiting for their daughters. But I also saw a lot of poverty Mm -hmm. You know, and and when I say poverty, I don't just mean oh, I mean a lot of people are poor, right? And I mean how, for how long can you talk about that? However, in the case of these women, what I saw was just wrong. Now these are women who have experienced a tragedy that literally brought the world to a standstill at mm -hmm. least for a few days, mm -hmm. and then you still have them going through these things that are easily manageable. So you have parents who are dying of because of trauma directly linked to the loss. You have 
people who have stroke, they can't move now because of that. And I'm saying to myself, and I'm, I'm asking them, is there no therapy? Is there anyone, no one taking care of you guys, like, you know, asking, looking out for your welfare? And the answer is no. And I, I think, I still think that's very, very wrong on so many levels. And so the Curiosity Project now became a campaign of sorts to use the film as a vehicle to draw attention to the plight of these women and say, hey, look, guys, we can't move on. We can't move on as a people. And I'm not, I've always said, I look, I could care less about, you know, what government is or is not doing. As human beings, we have a responsibility to each other. Mm. You can't be walking down the road and see you going through stuff and just walk by. You understand what I mean? I think that that's what's happened, you know, for the people of Chibok, the women in Chibok. Um, they are going through what many of us have never gone through, you know, may not be able to go through. And, and so they, they need our support. Mm. And that's what this film is all about, getting them all the support that we can get them just to make their lives a little bit easier while they wait for their daughters. Mm. That's the least that you and I can do. Okay, are these supports coming in in any way? Well, yeah, I mean, we've gotten a lot of promises. Um, um, a good friend of, of ours who joined, you know, um, us on this uh, mission, um, Stephanie Bosari, uh, came on board and just did everything in her power to make sure that, you know, she could get Iana to come to New York because the film was going to be shown on the sidelines of Onga, the mm -hmm. United Nations General Assembly. And so we met quite a few people um, in the UN and, and promises have been made, you know. But I also think that it would be nice if, because let's be honest with ourselves, right? Woman leaves Chibok, goes to New York to go and seek for support for her people. And we have Nigerians. So I think that it's, we, we, should, we can do more as a mm. people ourselves. Some support is coming in, but more. We're trying to impact, what, 276 families? So we need, we need a lot more support to come in. Because we haven't done anything tangible yet. We're just speaking to people and getting the funds, you know, speaking to them to get the funds to come in. But, you know, it's, uh, it's still a challenge. And we hope that, uh, you know, come end of the year, we'll mm -hmm. be able to say, hey, look, you know, Yana and all the women and all the men, this is what the world, Nigerians, have been able to raise for you. Now you can take it you know, get something for your farm, get some therapy, get some help, and just know that the world hasn't forgotten you. All right, so when you got there, I'm still curious about <laughs> this story, mm -hmm. right? When you got there, was there something you saw that completely blew your mind, something you did not expect to see at all? So I told Yana, take me to your farm. Okay. Because she's a farmer, and all the women in Chibok are farmers. And then she takes me to this place that looks like a desert. And I said, no, ma, I want you to take me to your farm. This is not like we're shooting film or anything. Mm -hmm. Take me to your actual farm. <laughs> and she laughs and says, my son, this is my farm. And she walks a few feet away and scratches the ground and brings out granuts and shows me. I'm like, this is a farm. I think that was, that was something that really, really stayed with me. It didn't look anything like, it didn't look like a place that anything can grow out, anything can come out from that ground. It was barren, it was dry, it was crusty. It was, you know, all kinds of weird. But that's her farm, you know. And I said, but why is it like this? He said, well, we don't have fertilizer. We don't have money to buy fertilizer. So I was like, okay, you know, we'll see what we can do about that, mm. you know. So I think that's one thing that really, really stayed with me. It was one scene that really stayed with me um, in, in Chibok. All right, let's go for another quick break, and when we come back, we'll definitely carry on this conversation. Welcome back. So, um, I feel like, because I know you on a personal level, I feel mm. like there's a personal inspiration that made you, that is fueling all the story you're telling. Mm. Although the story did not start after the very tragic incident happened to you, but I think there has been a change of balance mm. in your mindset. Mm. So would you say the kidnap experience you had has kind of fueled your passion more? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Um, being, you know, getting kidnapped was, you know, one of those things that happens to you 
once in a lifetime and stays with you forever. Okay. Um, it wasn't what, I mean, I never expected it to happen. And I thought that, I thought I would never come back from it. All right. And so when I came back, obviously, you begin to appreciate life a little bit more. And then you begin to ask yourself, okay, so what this means is that I can go at any time. When I do go, what will I be remembered for? What are the things that I would have done that, that have made any difference in anybody's life? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I don't know if that's what's, I, I wouldn't say that's what's fueling because then it becomes, oh, okay, so go get yourself kidnapped and then you can get some inspiration to do some, some cool stuff. No, I just feel like it sort of opened my eyes to being, to, I said, ask myself some deeper questions, like why do I do what I do? Um, what are the kind of films that I want to make? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, is this all about just, you know, getting a quick buck, you know, making money and all of that? And, and the answer for me was, you know what, look for the stories that matter and tell them, you know, and play your own path in, you know, leaving this place a better place than how you met it, right? Mm. Does that answer your question? I think being kidnapped is one of those incidences that some Nigerians will experience and they tell you it is time to check out, meaning it's time to leave the country. Yes. I, Did I you feel that way at the time? Oh, well, mm. so I love Nigeria. Okay. Um, people who are close to me will tell you that I'm someone that believes a lot in this country, regardless of you know, all the things that I feel are wrong. I still love Nigeria. I remember when I, the first day I came out when I was released and my younger brother called me and my friend, it was a conference call. And the first question they asked me was, so when are you coming? <laughs> because everyone thought I was going to leave. Mm -hmm. And I said to them, I can't leave Niger. It's not possible. Not at this time. Hmm. And in fact, when I came out, I intentionally didn't travel out of the country for like maybe nine months. Because I knew that there's anything that would take me out immediately after that kidnap, I probably don't want to come back again. So um, leaving the country was not a priority for me at the time. It still is not. If I was based in the US now, surely I'll be able to tell Chibok's story. Mm. You understand? If we all check out, who's going to tell our stories? Okay, so are you focusing on the technology for telling the story or the story? Because, I mean, the VR thing is, like I said earlier, it's really the new cool in technology, right? So is, are, is your focus <laughs> there or the story right now? My focus has always been on the story. Mm -hmm. VR is just another tool mm -hmm. for storytelling for me. It's always been about the story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, you know, I've not switched from regular documentary filmmaking, from 2D filmmaking. I still do my 2D filmmaking. I will still make documentaries in 2D. VR is just another, what's it called now, medium of expression. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I'll still be doing my VR stuff. I'll still do my regular stuff. You know, I'm not, I'm not very hung up on the technology. It's about the story, always about the story for okay. me. Yeah. So back to um, the lady in the story, you recently came back from an advocacy tour to mm. the United Nations, I think, mm -hmm. and um, it was to mark the 2000th day of the cheaper girls going missing. Mm -hmm. What would you say that journey has done now? And um, do you think it is a stepping stone for positivity that we're expecting in that situation? Well, what, what that tour, what the, what the visit has done, what the film has done, is to remind people again. So, you know, so now we have a lot of people talking about it. You know, I've had people walk up to me and hug me and say, hey, thank you for reminding me. I had forgotten. I had moved on. And so that's great. So what is done, at least in the immediate, is to remind people that the Chibok story hasn't ended yet. There are still 112 girls that are missing. Okay, now the next thing is for us to move from empathy to action. Mm. And the action is what can we do for these women whilst they wait for their daughters? So, so I think that to a large extent, the visit to the UN was fantastic. I mean, she met with the UN Under Secretary General, she met with the head of UN Women, you know, she met guys at TEDx, at Facebook, you know, I mean, she, Yana, for a woman from Chibok, man, she met with some high rollers, mm -hmm. you know. And like I said before, promises were made. And we hope that the people who have made those promises will stand by their word 
and, and do something for them. Um, she was interviewed on Guardian UK, she was interviewed on CNN, you know, I mean, it doesn't get bigger than that in yeah. terms of getting attention to the issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is there a possibility for people who want to see this um, film yeah. and cannot access um, the kind of technology in there to see it? Are you going to do anything to make it possible for us to see it in the not regular 2D, 3D settings? Well, I mean, the whole point of making it in 360 is to give people that, that immersive experience. Okay. And I'm very, very focused on doing that. So in order for more people to see it, where we have screenings, you know, that come up regularly where people can come and see it. But obviously those screenings are targeted at raising funds for the women. Okay. Um, so which is why like we set up a GoFundMe, you know, so that people can actually like donate funds. So you watch the film, you know, you feel like, oh wow, this is wrong. I want to be, be a part of this. And then you donate something. So those are, what, that's what we're doing now, it's targeted screenings. Okay. Um, and so I guess it would be a case of just, you know, maybe following us on our page and finding out what's going on. Um, you hear if there's a screening and then you can come and experience it. Um, it was just, it screened at the last Lights Camera Action, Lights Camera Africa Festival, okay. uh, film festival in Lagos. Um, there are also other big film festivals coming up later in the year in, mm -hmm. in Lagos and we'll be hopefully um, showing the films there mm -hmm. or showing the film there okay. so people can always come there and, and, experience, and experience it. That's the model for now. Hmm. So what next for you? What are the stories on your radar? Ah, mm -hmm. like I said, Africa is full of stories. Nigeria is full of stories, man. Okay. I mean, there are a few ideas in my head, um, but after doing this for, you know, about a decade now, I've realized that the stories that want to be told have a way of just coming out. Hmm. So I'll just... I'll so just, you're not sharing any... Uh, any no, I'll ride the tide. <laughs> okay. I, want, I want to do all kinds of stories now. Mm -hmm. You know me now. Me, my head is restless. Mm -hmm. My legs are restless. But the film that wants to be told next will somehow figure its way out and, and we will tell it. Okay, very quickly. Do you think the BBC I model kind of journalism is the future of journalism? What's that now? Tell me. Have you seen the Sex for Grids story? Yeah, I've seen the... Yeah, yeah so mm -hmm. be investigative journalism yes, basically that's like what using it is. like hidden cameras yeah. and stuff. do you think that is the future of journalism do you think that's what we need to make the change we need in this part of the world now as humans we will always evolve so it's what's raining now yeah you know it's 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 another like i said medium of expression mm -hmm. you know time will come when you do all these guys wise up to it when you walk into their room they will tell you, go there, strip you naked, mm -hmm. dust out everything, wear you back your clothes, and then you can start talking. You mm -hmm. know, people will always evolve and figure out ways to circumvent yes. technology and all of that. Mm. But it, it is what it is now, so let's make the most of it. Okay. And like I said, as humans, we're, we always evolve. So there will be something else that will come up, you know, tomorrow that, you know, would be the in thing. For now, journalists or filmmakers or whatever who feel like they want to tell stories where they would not easily have access to, but they want to use this kind of technology, should take full advantage of it and use it to its best. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, ma'am. All right. We've been chatting with Joel Kachi Benson. He is a documentary filmmaker and he shared his story of going to Chibok and to create the daughters of Chibok. My name is Elsie Godwin. Thank you for watching. And remember, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel, A Plus TV Africa, to catch up on our exclusive content. Thank you for watching again and see you later. Thank you.